This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello. Six o'clock. I am Marcia Joyner, and this is the Ties That Bind. We are doing a series on the Ties That Bind because sometimes it doesn't make sense and other times it really does. But we have talked to lots of people about their experiences in America and all of the issues and problems that have arised, arisen as we work toward democracy and equality for ever, everyone. Today we are doing part two of the 125-year legacy of the Afro-American newspapers. And we are talking with Jake Oliver, who is the publisher emeritus and chair of the board for 30 plus years, is it? Jake? Yeah, I'm, I'm former, former chair of the board for 30 Former plus, for 30 plus mm -hmm. years. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome, Jake. Thank you for coming to part two. Now, just so everybody understands, this gorgeous man is my cousin. We share <laughs> grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents. A long, long history of being same blood. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> out of that, all of those people came the Afro-American newspapers. And we did talk about the beginning. And so real quick, Jake, can we, for anyone that didn't see part one, can you bring us up to date? Sure. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be invited uh, to be part of uh, your program, um, Marcia. Um, uh, the ASO uh, uh, occupies a very important, uh, prominent uh, uh, position in the history of the African American community. And its uh, uh, a position uh, has reflected uh, how that community has uh, been subjected to, overcome, and evolved, uh, particularly during uh, uh, the decades of the 20th century, uh, so as to give the current readers a sense of how that role of the black press, uh, as reflected by the Afro, uh, continues to play such an important role as we continue the uh, overcome, continue to overcome the challenges uh, in this century. Um, uh, last program, uh, we, we talked about uh, the first three decades and how the, the black community evolved from uh, being totally uh, uh, occupied and, and controlled. Uh, by uh, a Jim Crow uh, American society, uh, but how uh, that uh, community, uh, beginning in the first decade, uh, started to develop its own voice uh, and slowly uh, began to air uh, and begin to get a strength in uh, voicing its objection uh, uh, to the injustices uh, of a Jim Crow America that denied uh, not only uh, the entire community, uh, particularly in the South, uh, its right to vote, uh, but also uh, as a result of segregation, uh, denied any semblance of equality and justice in many other levels of what most America uh, accepts or takes for granted as the American way of life. Um, uh, it's been a struggle, uh, but it's been very interesting to see how um, the community and how the Afro has, has highlighted uh, uh, the struggle uh, and where we ended uh, last, last, uh, last, the last program was, uh, well, some of the things we highlighted was the, uh, the, the dealing with uh, the lynchings, um, uh, how uh, the uh, paper had to deal with uh, the fact that 
uh, the black vote really was never recognized. And when it does was finally recognized, how it was, in essence, violated, um, how the community was lied to by uh, uh, the uh, Woodrow Wilson past, uh, president um, in order to get him elected. Um, um, but also there were uh, how the uh, black soldiers uh, who participated in, uh, in World War I uh, were indeed violated as well. Uh, uh, we ended with the, the approach of the, uh, the cloud of the Second World War uh, and how uh, the black community indeed wanted to occupy uh, a meaningful role in uh, defending and, uh, the country's interests. But how that uh, was indeed uh, itself a struggle. Um, black soldiers were not accorded uh, any level of equality, and segregated units uh, was uh, just a standard. Uh, it wasn't something that uh, was even addressed until after the Second World War. Um, and uh, we, I, I believe, uh, Marsha, we ended with um, uh, uh, the 1944. Yes, that's where where we ended it was 1944, mm -hmm. and one of the articles that appeared in the Afro. Yes. So, and that's where I'd like to. Okay, know, let's let's let's, let's do that. Uh, the uh, the April eighth, 1944 edition of the Afro uh, was indeed one of my. I guess my one of my favorite ones because it, it reflects uh, such a, 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 a wide swath of major issues. Uh, many, most of the uh, uh, front page of that particular edition was focused on racial discrimination. Uh, the big story was uh, how their Supreme Court had eliminated, uh, if you can believe it, uh, a Texas uh, decision uh, that outlawed blacks uh, from participating in uh, Texas primaries. <laughs> uh, they were white-only primaries. Black oh, really? Oh, well, 1944, uh, yeah. yeah. That's 1944. Yes. Uh, but uh, in, in my opinion, uh, the, the, the most interesting article uh, was a, uh, an article that was uh, about, it was an interview exclusive Afro interview of Albert Einstein hmm. at his home in Princeton. Uh, uh, and it was a discussion of getting his view of comparing uh, uh, his perception of what he was subjected to as being a member of the Jewish community in uh, Germany uh, during the war uh, uh, and compare his experiences with and perceptions with what he saw uh, the black community was uh, uh, exposed to here in America. Uh, it's it's a, it's a, it's a riveting article because uh, first of all, not only do you get a real clear sense of uh, at that time uh, uh, one of the world's most respected scientists, indeed one of the most <laughs> smartest men on the country, on Earth at that time, but uh, you also uh, get a sense of what Albert Einstein was uh, like. As a human being, I mean, you get a sense of uh, he was a professor at, at Princeton. Uh, the interview occurred at his house. Uh, he answered the door um, uh, with his slippers on and what looked like pajamas. Um, he looked like uh, an extreme intellect. Um, and as the article shows, uh, he enjoyed laughing at his own jokes. Um, uh, but his study was, as you would expect, to be. Uh, loaded with paper, uh, this man was in constant thought. But the main thrust of this article, as I indicated, was uh, what he, he, he what message he could give to the black community. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I have a, a, an excerpt from that article uh, okay. that I think is is, is really telling. Of, All right, of, of, of please. What he thought. He said the scientist said the young American sees the colored man in a socially and economically undesirable role and assume that such a role is designed for the colored citizen. In short, race prejudice, race, race prejudice is as traditional to Americans as movie stars, pumpkin pies, 
the two-party system, and radio crews. Racial tolerance will not be furthered by the war, Dr. Einstein said. In general, wars retired civilization, he pointed out. The last war ended with the KKK. Why should you expect social achievement in a time of passion and hysteria? You should not expect positive health from this war. Um, that was a, a, a fairly negative message. Um, but unfortunately, it was true. It is true. Um, and you know, World War II did not end segregation, no. did not end Jim Crow, did not reduce Jim Crow until 1949 when Harry Truman. Uh, eliminated segregation in the armed services, but even and then. Even uh, that, because not, the Air Force only complied in 1952. But since we're talking about this, Admiral uh, Rickover, who is the father of the nuclear power uh, in the Navy, was at the uh, Naval Academy and he was segregated. They sent them to Coventry, and that was where nobody could talk to them. They were totally, the few Jews that were at the Naval Academy were totally isolated from everyone else. So it wasn't just, uh, I mean, it was across the board. The, the way the Americans treated the Jews uh, was horrible. And we will, mm -hmm. we will do a, a program, uh, we have already planned to do a program to talk about what the Jews went through in, in America. So, yeah. 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 It's, uh, it, it, it was uh, talking about the, the segregation in the armed services. Uh, the APRO did a, a series of articles in celebration of uh, Barack Obama's second inauguration that, that reviewed and shared with the readers over a course of about six or seven weeks, a full-page article with photos of the Apple coverage of each of the inaugurations, uh, beginning with the, Teddy, uh, the inauguration of, of 1905, um, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and it, it really gives a background in each of the inaugurations uh, during the series uh, of exactly how the segregation and how the black community uh, was, number one, uh, totally segregated, uh, how it basically uh, accepted it during the first three to four decades, and how that began to evolve with the election of, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, with a lot of help from his wife, oh, uh, yes. Delano. Uh, and, and, but how, uh, in spite of uh, Roosevelt, uh, changes really did not really appear in the inauguration of our country's presidents until, surprisingly, uh, the uh, inauguration of Harry Truman, who really did not really hold out a whole lot of high expectations to the black community, um, uh, but un until his, in, until his uh, actions uh, to uh, integrate uh, the armed services in, uh, right after World War II, uh, and, and as a result of which, uh, uh, the, his inauguration really was something unlike anything else uh, that the black community was had, had been exposed to up to that point. Um, the, the integration uh, in most of the events, there was almost total integration in all the events of the inauguration celebrations. And, uh, but there was one item which was particularly uh, interesting. That 1949 was, the inaugura was Harry Truman's inaugura inauguration. Um, and it was also the first inauguration that was televised by, on TV. And uh, the Afro on January 29th, 1949, had a uh, granite column. Uh, by Charles Hamilton Houston, who uh, was a head uh, legal counsel for the NAACP, a legal defense fund, but also most noted as the uh, mentor of uh, Thurgood Marshall. You have to uh, add. Who, you have to add that Thurgood Marshall also worked for the Afro. Next, keep going. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, just keep going. <laughs> and and but what what he what uh, Charles Hamilton Houston wrote was uh, he was so impressed by the integration uh, that was reflected in the inaugural events of uh, celebrating the inauguration of, uh, of Harry Truman. Uh, that he wrote in his uh, in this uh, art in this article or in this column, he said last Thursday I kept wondering whether the first colored president of the United States was among the children looking at the inaugural parade in person or by television or listening to it over the radio, or whether he has been born. Personally, I think he's been born, and that if we can speed our rate of progress and self-discipline. Some of us may live to see him inaugurate. Of course, when that day comes, it will not make any difference to the people what blood he has. The sole question is likely to be simply whether he is the best man or woman, why not, for the job. Well, Jay? Uh, this was in 1949, <laughs> and Barack wasn't born until 1960. Uh, but, yeah. But, but he was so overwhelmed by the integration that, in essence, his message was, uh, God, we, we've arrived. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we are now involved in a, a total, not a total integration, but the, the most integrated celebration of uh, the inauguration of an American president that has ever w been witnessed in the history of this country. Well, uh, and, and that was quite an accomplishment. We need to Jim take Crow a break. We need to take a break, and we will come mm -hmm. back in sixty seconds. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, "What's happening, guys?" They told me they were making music. Aloha, welcome to Hawaii. This is Prince Dykes, your host of the Prince of Investing, coming to you guys each and every Tuesday at 11 a.m. right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Don't forget to come by and check out some of the great information on stocks, investings, your money, all the other great stuff, and I'll be your host. See you Tuesday. Aloha. I'm Marsha, and this, these are the ties that bind. And today, we are doing part two of the 125-year legacy of the Afro-American newspapers. And with us, all the way from somewhere over there in Baltimore, Maryland, is Jake. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a long way. And it's Jake Oliver, who is publisher emeritus and chair of the board of the Afro-American Newspapers for? Past. Past. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. So we were just up to 1949? 49. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see how far we can go. <laughs> OK. OK. Um, following the inauguration of, of, of Harry Truman, uh, the uh, the, the community had a whole lot of hope that the Jim Crow limitations that had become such a fixture, such a fixture of the American society, uh, was going to begin to change, and opportunities uh, uh, were going to begin. Equal opportunities were going to begin to emerge. Um, the election of the first uh, Republican uh, president. Uh, 1952-53 um, was um, of Dwight Eisenhower, and um, that sort of gave the community a, a, a certain degree of pause, uh, because primarily the, the community and the paper uh, sort of held uh, hope out uh, of a new administration, uh, mostly as a result of what uh, the inaugural speech of the incoming president was going to be, and whether or not there was going to be any reference to civil rights. 
Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who was really primarily terribly, as he, justifiably so in many respects, uh, focused on the Korean War uh, and the looming threat of the new nuclear threat that was uh, had emerged in, in 1952 and, and, and even more so in, in the beginning of 53. Um, so uh, unfortunately, Dwight Eisenhower didn't reference civil rights at all, and uh, the community really had a, uh, it, it was bleak. It didn't really have a whole lot of hope. Uh, but uh, to his credit, uh, President Eisenhower uh, changed his, uh, his stance uh, when he made his first speech to Congress, and he did reference the importance of civil rights. Uh, and suddenly the uh, the events that were going to begin, that were beginning to emerge um, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, with the uh, uh, decision in 1954 of uh, Brown versus uh, Brown versus Board, um, and then shortly after that, the uh, uh, the Alabama uh, bus strike, the emergence of the, uh, a new uh, spokesperson. A young black Baptist minister from uh, Atlanta, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King, was going to really begin to uh, change a lot uh, of the uh, um, black community's uh, level of hope because um, Eisenhower began to recognize the importance of, of eliminating uh, Jim Crow. Uh, and started out by eliminating and making sure that uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, would be, as the capital of this country, uh, an example of total integration in uh, the death of Jim Crow that had been uh, tolerated so long. Um, but this was uh, now the beginning of what most people you know, view as the, as the modern-day uh, uh, civil rights uh, movement, modern-day of the of the 20th century, that is. Yeah, uh, let me but just in, in, interject one thing here. I know mm -hmm. most people say, oh, that was the beginning, but I always have to interject that, no, the beginning of the civil rights movement was when the first slave said, I ain't doing this. So we, but <laughs> go ahead. This was, to me, that yeah. was the beginning. Uh, I know that in terms of modern day thinking, and in most of what we read, they say the 1950s and 60s as the modern day civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's when, that's the age of King, and that's when uh, the, the, the voice of the objection against Jim Crow, particularly in the South, uh, began to uh, shock the rest of the world. Uh, and, and Jim Crow started to disappear. And it, it was a, it, an important part of the evolution of the 20th, of the freedoms um, uh, that we are so uh, protective of today, uh, but still have got to continuously um, uh, expand uh, even more so. Uh, but it was, it was the emergence of, of Dr. King that, that really, uh, the paper started to really, among those other things, uh, started to focus on uh, the other things being um, the, uh, the 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 bus boycott in, in Alabama uh, and the the, uh, uh, the integration of various uh, uh, higher education institutions such as the University of Alabama and then the uh, uh, Central High School in in, in in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, those were some very dramatic and violent periods of time, but it was uh, King's voice that rose above all the clamor and all the violence that really attracted a lot of attention. Um, one of the, 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 the frightened things um, uh, that caught my, uh, again, caught my attention was a 1958 article, edition, um, uh, that, that talked about uh, how King was continuously exposed to uh, 
of the violence. And there's two aspects of this addition of the Afro that I, I thought was, uh, was, was notable. Um, it started out talking about the racial hatred that Reverend uh, King was frequently confronted with as a result of his various nonviolent campaigns against racial discrimination in, in 58. Um, that campaign reached an unexpected and shocking pinnacle at a book signing event that was, I think it, it absolutely froze everyone. Um, uh, because that event took place uh, in Harlem, uh, and it was, you know, he was giving autographs um, about his new book, Stride Toward Freedom, on September 17th. At that book signing event, a woman approached Dr. King, asked him if he was Dr. King, and when he indicated that he was, she, without warning, plunged a six-inch switchblade knife into his chest. Front page headlines of the Afro reported that while still in critical condition, Dr. King was nevertheless out of danger a little more than a week after the frightening incident, according to the doctors at Harlem Hospital. Uh, in the main part of the front page, Considerable space was devoted to examining the unusual circumstances surrounding what might have prompted this woman to commit this act. She was black and living in Harlem, which was absolutely a shock. Given the obvious dangers Dr. King had continuously faced in the visible, more hostile areas of the South, this violent attack was made even more shocking to everyone, including New York Governor Abel Harriman, who held a vigil outside Dr. King's hospital room until he had received word that King was out of danger. While the woman was committed, who committed the act is often referred to as, in the article as deranged, it was nevertheless clear that in 1958, Dr. King could apparently not be considered safe anywhere, even among his own people. That article, I, I thought, was, was shocking. Um, but it, it was even more interesting Marsha, that an, an, an article right beside that article was uh, an article that was even more poignant, but relevant to, you know, what King had just been subjected to. It talked about the spiritual strength of Dr. King to rise above these continuous threats to himself, his wife, and children is re was reflected in a poignant article in the center of that front page, right next to the article describing his David Stab, and the article was entitled, How Reverend King Foresaw Death and Conquered All Fear. This article focused on how almost three years before his Harlem close brush with death, Dr. King described in his recently published book the spiritual battle he had to personally address to overcome his fear of death and internal hostilities in order to continue his nonviolent campaign against racial injustice. How Dr. King overcome, overcame is a stimulating historical explanation of how the Harlem incident and all the past and future foreboding challenges were not able to defeat the King leadership, which in 1958 America was just beginning to witness. Jake. Mm -hmm. oh, and we're only up to 1958? Yes. Well, we are almost out of time, but ah, so at some point we're going to have to keep going. So you're going to have to agree to come back if we're okay. only up to 1958. And, and I guess I was, I don't know what I was thinking when I thought we could get 125 years <laughs> Into this little the bit of time. Has covered so much because the, the look the road that this paper has traveled, like the community that it was covering. Yes. Uh, is, is it's it's not you know it, it's not a short trip. No, it's not. No. I don't know what I was thinking about when I thought we could get this in. So you will come back and we will talk more because I did get people from Baltimore who said. I want to see the part two. So now we have to do part three. Uh, okay, I'll be happy to. Thank you, darling. It is a pleasure, even if this is the only way I get to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.